Telephone conversation between President Johnson and FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover on November 29, 1963, at 1.40 p.m. Yes? J. Hey, Edgar Hoover on 2192. Are you familiar with this uh, proposed group that they're trying to put together on this study of your report and other things, uh, two from the House, two from the Senate, somebody in the court, and, uh, a couple outsiders? No, I haven't heard of that. I, I, I've seen the uh, reports on this on the Senate investigating committee that they've been talking about. Yeah, well, we think if we don't have, I want to get by just uh, with your file and your report. I uh, think it would be, be very, very bad to have a rash of investigations. Well, the thing. only way we can stop them is probably uh, to appoint a high level one to evaluate your report yeah. and put somebody that's uh, pretty good on it from uh, that I can select. Uh, uh, out of the government uh, and tell the House and Senate uh, not to go ahead with the investigation. Yes. Because we get up there and get a bunch of television going, and I thought it'd be bad. It'd be a three ring circus. Uh, yes. What do you think about Alan Dulles? Uh, I think he would be a good man. What do you think about John McCloy? Uh, I'm not as enthusiastic about, about McCloy. I knew him back in the Patterson, when Patterson's down here, the secretary thing. He's a good man. But uh, I'm not so certain as to the uh, matter of the publicity that he might seek on it. What about General Nordstrom? Uh, good man. Um, I guess Boggs has started in the House. I thought maybe I might try to get Boggs and Jerry Ford uh, in the House, maybe try to get Dick Russell and uh, maybe Cooper in the Senate. Yes, I think so. I don't know. You know anything, any reason? Uh, just talking to me and you're going to talk like brothers. Yeah, you no. Know, well, there is any reason, uh, uh, any there. I thought Russell could kind of look after uh, the general situation and see that uh, the states uh, and their relationship. Russell would be an excellent man. And I thought Cooper might look after the liberal group. Who's that? Uh, Cooper from Kentucky. Oh, yeah, Cooper. So they wouldn't think that he's a pretty judicious fellow, yeah. but he's a pretty liberal fellow. Yeah. I wouldn't want Javits or, no, no. or, or some of those no. on it. Uh, Javits plays the front page. Cooper, Cooper, Cooper's kind of a uh, border state. Yes. Yeah. It's not the south, it's not the north. That's right. Do you know Ford from Michigan? Uh, I know of him, but I don't know him. Uh, I saw him on TV the other night for the first time. He handled himself well on that. You know Boggs? Uh, I, oh, yes, I know Boggs. He's kind of author of the resolution. That's yeah, what I yes, said. yes, I know him. Now, Walter tells me, Walter Jenkins, that, uh, that you've designated Deke to work with us like you did on the hill. I have, yes. I tell you, I sure appreciate that. I didn't ask for it because I knew you you how to run your business better than anybody else, and I just won't tell you, though, that we consider him as high class as you do, and it's a mighty gracious thing to do, and we'd be mighty happy. And well, be, we, we salute you for knowing how to pick good men. Well, that's mighty nice of you, Mr. President, indeed. Okay. Uh, we're being, uh, we hope to have this thing wrapped up today, but we're being, we probably won't get it before the first of the week. This angle in Mexico is giving us a great deal of trouble mm -hmm. because uh, the stories they have this man Oswald getting $6,500 uh, from the Cuban embassy mm. uh, and then coming back to this country with it. Uh, they, we, we're not able to prove uh, that fact. But the information was that he was there on the 18th of September in Mexico City, and we, have, we are able to prove conclusively he was in New Orleans that day. Now, then they moved, they changed the date. The story came in changing the date to the 28th of, of September, and he was in Mexico City on the 28th. Now, the Mexican police have again arrested this woman, Duran, who's a member of the, of the uh, Cuban embassy, and will hold her for two or three more days. And we're going to confront her with the, the original informant who saw the money pass, so he says, and we're also going to put the lie detector test on him. Meantime, of course, Castro's hollering his head off. Can you pay attention to those lie detector tests? I, I would not... Uh, pay 100 attention, uh, 100 percent uh, attention to them. All that they are is a psychological uh, asset in a in an investigation. I wouldn't want to be a part to sending a man to the chair on a lie detector. Uh, they, uh, for instance, we have found many cases where where we've used them, and in a bank where there's been embezzlement, and a person will confess before the lie detector test is finished. Are more or less fearful of the fact that the lie detector test will show them guilty. Mm -hmm. Psychologically, uh, there's that advantage because 
It's a misnomer to call it a lie detector because what it really is, it's the evaluation of the chart that is made by this machine. Uh, it, and that evaluation is made by a human being. Mm -hmm. And any human being can uh, be apt to make a wrong interpretation. Mm -hmm. So I would not myself go on that alone if, on the other hand, in the, if this fellow Oswald had lived and had taken the out of the lie detector test and it had shown definitely uh, that he had done these various things together with the evidence that we very definitely have, uh, they, it would have uh, just added that, that much more strength to it. There's no question but that he is the man now with the fingerprints and things that we have. This uh, fellow uh, uh, Rubenstein down there, uh, he has offered to take the lie detector test but his lawyer has got to be cost consulted first, and I doubt whether the lawyer will allow him. He's one of these criminal lawyers from the West Coast, mm -hmm. and somewhat like an Edward Bennett Williams type, and almost as much of a shyster. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Have you got any uh, any relationship between the two yet? Uh, between uh, uh, Rubenstein? Yeah. No, at the present time, we have not. There was, was he, a story down there that... Was uh, he ever in his bar and stuff like that? There was that? a story that this fellow had been in this nightclub, that he, this strip tease joint that he has, but that has not been able to be confirmed. Now, uh, this fellow Rubenstein is a, is a very shady character, has a bad record, street brawler, fighter, and that sort of thing. And uh, in the place in Dallas, if a fellow came in there and couldn't pay his bill completely, Rubenstein would beat the very devil out of him and then throw him out of the place. He was that kind of a fella. He didn't drink, didn't smoke, boasted about that. He would, he, he's what I would put in the category, one of these egomaniacs. He likes to be in the limelight. He knew all the police uh, in that white light district where the joints are down there. And he also uh, let them come in, see the show, get food and get liquor and so forth. That's how I think he got into police headquarters uh, because uh, they accepted him as kind of a police character hanging around police headquarters. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, raised no, no question. Of course, they, they never made any moves as, as the picture show, even when they saw him approaching this, uh, this fellow and got up right to him and pressed his pistol against, uh, against Oswald's stomach. Uh, 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 neither of the police officers on either side made any move to push him away or to grab him. It wasn't until after the gun was fired that they then moved. Now, of course, that, that is not the highest degree of efficiency, so I to say. Secondly, the chief of police admits that he uh, moved him in the morning uh, as a convenience and at the request of the motion picture people who wanted to have daylight. He should have moved him at night, but he didn't. And, uh, I mean, it, uh, those derelictions in that phase. But so far as tying Rubenstein and Oswald together, we haven't as yet done so. There have been a number of stories come in. Uh, we've tried we've, we've tried Oswald into the uh, Civil Liberties Union in New York, membership into that, and of course into this uh, thing, uh, this to this Cuban Fair Play Commission uh, committee, which is which was pro Castro and dominated by communism and financed uh, to some extent by the Castro government. How many how many how many shots were fired? Three. Oh, any of them fired at me? Uh, no, there was no, they, all three at the president. All three at the president, and we have them. Uh, two of the shots fired at the president were splinted, uh, but they had characteristics on them so that our ballistic expert was able to prove that they were fired by this gun. Uh, the, the third shot, which, uh, which hit the president, he was hit by the first and the third. The second shot hit the governor. The third shot is a, completely, is a complete bullet that wasn't shattered, and that rolled out of the president's head. It tore a large part of the president's head off. And, uh, in trying to massage his heart at the, on the, at the hospital, on the way to the hospital, they uh, apparently uh, loosened that and it, it fell onto the, the stretcher. And we recovered that. And we have that. And we have the gun here also. Were they aiming at the president? Uh, they were aiming directly at the president. There, they, there's no question about that. This, this telescopic lens, which I had looked through, it brings a person as close to you as if they were sitting right beside you. And uh, we also have tested the fact that you could fire those three shots were fired uh, within three seconds. There's been some stories going around the papers and so forth that uh, there must have been more than one man but because no one man could fire those shots in the time that they were fired. We've just proved that by the actual test that we've made. How did it happen? They hit Connolly. Uh, Connolly turned. Ahead. Connolly turned to the president at the, when the first shot was fired. 
And I think in that in that turning, it was where he got hit. If he hadn't a turn, he probably wouldn't have got hit. I think that's very likely. When the president got hit the second one? Uh, no, no, the president wasn't hit with the second one. At the, I see if, he, if Connolly had been in his way. Oh, oh yes, yes. Uh, the president, no doubt, would have been hit. He'd been hit three times. He would have been hit three times. You know, on the fifth floor of that building where we found the gun and the wrapping paper in which the gun was uh, wrapped, had been wrapped, and upon which we find the full fingerprints of this man, Oswald. Uh, we, uh, on that floor, we found the three empty shells that had been fired and one shell that had not been fired. In other words, there were four shells, four shells apparently, and he had, he had fired three, but didn't fire the fourth one. He then threw the gun aside and came down, and at the, at the entrance of the, of the building, he was stopped by a police officer and some uh, work of some manager in the building told the police officer, well, he's all right, he works safe, he can, uh, you needn't hold him. So they let him go. That's how he got out. Mm. And then he got on a bus. The bus driver has identified him and went out to his home and uh, got hold of a jacket that he wanted for some purpose and came back downtown, walking downtown. And uh, the uh, police officer who was killed stopped him, uh, not knowing who he was and not uh, knowing wh whether he was the man, but they were... Uh, just on suspicion, and he fired, of course, and killed the police officer. Then he walked down and walked you, about... You can prove that. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, we can prove that. Then he walked about another uh, another two blocks and went to the theater, and the woman at the theater window selling the tickets, she was so suspicious uh, of the way he was acting, and she said he was carrying a gun. He had a revolver at that time which he had, with which he had killed the police officer. Uh, the, he went into the theater, and then she notified the police, and the police and our man down there went in there and uh, located this particular man. We had quite a struggle with him. He fought like a regular lion, and he had to be subdued, of course, and his brother was then brought out and, of course, taken to the police uh, headquarters. But uh, he, he apparently uh, had come down uh, the five flights of steps, uh, stairway from the fifth floor, uh, so far as we found out, the elevator was not used, although he could have used it, but nobody remembers whether it was or whether it wasn't. Well, your conclusion is that A, he's the one that did it. B, the man he's after was the president. C, he would have hit him three times except the governor turned. I think that's correct. Four, that there's no connection between he and Ruby uh, that you can detect now. And five, whether... He was connected with the Cuban operation uh, with money you were trying to... That's what we're trying to nail down now. Because of course, he, he was strongly pro-Castro, he was strongly anti-American, and uh, he had been in correspondence, which we have, with the Soviet embassy here in Washington, and uh, with the, the American Civil Liberties Union, and with the, the, this committee for fair play to Cuba. We have copies of the, of the correspondence. So uh, that uh, we've got him nailed down in, in his contact with him. None of those letters, however, dealt with any indication of violence or contemplated assassination. They were dealing with the matter of a visa for his wife to go back to Russia. Now, there's one angle of this thing that I'm hopeful to get some word on today. Uh, this woman, his wife, had been very hostile. She would not cooperate. She speaks Russian and Russian only. She did say to us yesterday down there that if we could give her assurance that she would be allowed to remain in this country, she uh, might cooperate. I told our agents down there to give her that assurance that she could stay in this country, and I sent a Russian-speaking agent into Dallas last night to interview her so that uh, we'll, we're, we've got her now, and uh, whether she knows anything or talks anything, I, don't, I, I of course, don't know and won't know. Where did he work in the building? On the same floor? He had access on all floors. But where was his office? Uh, well, he didn't have any particular office. Uh, he would, uh, orders came in for certain books, and some books would be on the first floor, second floor, third floor, and so forth. But he didn't, he didn't have any particular place he stationed? No, he had no, he had no particular place that he was stationed at all. He was just a general packer of, uh, of the uh, requisitions that came in for school books from the from the Dallas schools there. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, he had access, perfectly proper access, to the fifth floor and to the sixth floor. Usually, most of the employees were down on lower floors. Did anybody hear anybody see him on the fifth floor? Yeah. Uh, they, yes, he was seen on the fifth floor by one of the workmen there before the, uh, the assassination took place. He was seen there. 
So that, that we've got, got a, Did you get a picture of him shooting? No, oh, no. There was no picture taken of him shooting. Well, what was this picture that fellow sold for $25,000? That was you a know. picture taken of the parade and showing Mrs. Kennedy uh, uh, climbing out of the back seat. You see, there was no Secret Service man standing on the back of the car. Mm -hmm. uh, usually, this, the, the presidential car in the past has had uh, steps on the back next to the bumpers, and they've usually been one on either side standing on those steps at the, at the back bumper. Mm -hmm. uh, whether the president uh, 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 asked that that not be done, we don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, and the bubble top was not up, but the bubble top wasn't worth a damn anyway because it made entirely a, a, a plastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, much to my surprise, the Secret Service do not have any armored cars. Do you uh, do you have a, a bulletproof car? Oh, yes, I do. Yes, you I think do. I ought to have one? I think you most certainly should have one. Most certainly should. Uh, because uh, I have one here. I, we have one in New York. We use it for, for different purposes. I use it here for myself. And if we have any raids to make or have to surround a place where anybody's uh, hidden in, uh, we, we use a, the bulletproof car on that, uh, because you can bulletproof the entire car, including the glass. But it, it means that the top has to remain up. You can never let the top down. It's a regular limousine type, yeah. and it looks exactly like any other car, but I do think you ought to have a bulletproof car. And, uh, but, that, but I was surprised the other day when I made inquiry. All that I understand the Secret Service has had has had it two cars with metal plates underneath the car. Uh, to take care of a hand grenade or a bomb that might be thrown out and roll along the street. Well, of course, we don't do those things in this country. In Europe, that's the way they, they, they assassinate the heads of state are with bombs. They've been after General de Gaulle, you know, with that sort of thing. But uh, in this country, all of our assassinations have been with guns. And uh, for that reason, uh, uh, I think uh, very definitely I was very much surprised when I learned that this bubble top thing was not uh, bulletproof in any respect, and that the plastic at the top to it was down, of course. The president had insisted upon that so that he could stand up and wave to the crowd. Now, you, it, uh, it seems to me that the president ought to always be in a bulletproof car. Uh, it, uh, it certainly would prevent anything like this ever happening again. Uh, it doesn't mean you could have a thousand Secret Service men on guard, and still a sniper can snipe you from up in the window uh, if you are exposed, like the president was. But he, but he can't do it if you have a have a, a solid top uh, bulletproof top to it, as it should be. You mean I ride around my ranch? I ought to be in a bulletproof car. Well, I would certainly think so, uh, Mr. President. It seems to me that that uh, that, that car down at your ranch there, the uh, uh, little car that we rode around in when I was down there, uh, I think that ought to be bulletproof. I think it ought to be done very quietly. There's a concern that uh, is out, I think, in Cincinnati, where we, uh, we have our cars bulletproof. I think we've got four. We've got one on the West Coast, one in, in uh, New York, and one here. And uh, I think it, 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 it can be done quietly without any publicity being given to it or any pictures being taken of it if it's handled properly. But I think you ought to have, because on that ranch, there, it's perfectly easy for somebody to get onto the ranch. I uh, think those, think those entrances all ought to be guarded, though, don't you? Well, I think by all means. I think by all means. I think, I think you've got to recognize. You've got to really almost be in the, in the capacity of a so-called prisoner, uh, because uh, without that security, uh, uh, anything can be done. Now we've got a lot of letters and phone calls over the last uh, three or four, five days. We got one about the parade the other day. As to, that they were, going to, they, were going, they were going to try to kill you then. And uh, I talked uh, with the Attorney General about it. I was very much opposed to that marching from well, the, White, the White House. Too. Well, we, we, we Secret Service has told them not to, but the family felt otherwise. Well, I, yeah, that, that's what uh, Bobby told me, because when I heard of it, I talked with the Secret Service, and they were very much opposed to it. I was very much opposed to it, because it was even worse than down there at Dallas. You yes, were yes, walking I, down the center of the street. I think that's right. Well, that's you. Yeah. And somebody on the sidewalk could dash out. I noticed even on Pennsylvania Avenue here, I viewed the, uh, the procession coming back from the Capitol. And while they had police signs uh, along the curbstone, uh, looking at the crowd, when the parade came along, the police turned around and looked at the parade, <laughs> which was the worst thing to do. They also had a line of soldiers, but they were looking at the parade. Well, I'm going to take every precaution I can, and I, I, want, I, want, to. I want to talk to you, and I wish you'd put down your thoughts on that a little bit, because uh, you're more than a, 
you're more than the head of the Federal Bureau, as far as I'm concerned. You're my brother and personal friend, well, and you have been for 25, 30 years. Well, so I, I, have been for 25, 30 years. Well, I don't, I know, well, you just mean having your time. Absolutely not. So you just, uh, I got more confidence. Absolutely not. So I've got more confidence in your judgment than anybody in town. So you just put out some of the more judgment than anybody in town. You just put out some of the things you think ought to happen, and I won't involve you in court here get you in jurisdictional disputes or anything, but I, I'd like to at least advocate them as my opinion. I'll be very glad to, indeed. Uh, I certainly appreciate your confidence. Well, thank you. Thank you. Fine. Right.